There we are. We're on. Okay. So this final class uh, of uh, Susan Robb's um, uh, Angels and Shepherds. And, well, this is Angels and Shepherds, uh, Heart the Herald Angels Sing, the title of this one. But uh, the Angels of Christmas, this is the last one. So you have your, you'll need your text in front of you. And uh, so why don't we begin this coming into Christmas week by reading the text, which is Luke's version of the story of Christmas, okay? Last week we looked at Matthew's. Today we look at Luke. Luke has obviously a very different agenda in his writing. Uh, so uh, uh, so let's, it's a good way to start the Christmas week, this being Cantata Sunday, uh, to, to look at this text. So I'll just read it, Luke 2, 1 through 14. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to the towns to, the, to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, uh, because there was no, room, no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of a great joy for all people. To you is born this day, Come on, guys, in the city of David, and there's the text over there, Doug, uh, on the table. The city of David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. Let's bow our heads and pray as we begin this lesson. Lord, as we prepare our hearts and minds during this Advent season, give us the spirit of the shepherds who first heard the news of Jesus' birth. Reanimate our sense of wonder and amazement at what you have done for us, and grant us the courage to find our voices and pass along, not just through our words, but especially through our actions, the good news of great joy that your angels delivered for all humankind. Amen. So let's look at the, uh, let's look, hey Nancy, come on in. And the text is over there, Nancy. Let's look at the, um, um, the video. Hopefully it'll work. I haven't really tested it, but We'll uh, see. I mean, I just tested it this morning. Put the subtitles on. Make sure they're on. Yeah, they're on. Okay. Hopefully they're on. And I can't tell whether they're on or off. Oh, well. Find out. You may just have to listen. Oh, wait. Sometimes these videos are available on YouTube, but when you get a new one, they won't put it on YouTube until the season's over. Then they'll put it on YouTube, which doesn't make a lot of sense but anyway. So, so uh, okay. So let's take a moment to think about the story, uh, and we'll go through a little bit about what Susan Robb says. Uh, have you ever seen an image I'm sure you have somewhere, painting, uh, a recreation of the shepherds seen in the field and the angels speaking to them. What, what did it look like? What did it look like? Describe what it looked like when uh, it's depicted. I mean, we, I could have thrown some art up, but I just thought maybe we would just use our imagination or think about how it's been depicted and what it looked like. Yeah. 
Yes, very good, very good. So what else, what else do you see? Trumpets sometimes? Somet yes, yes, absolutely correct. Sometimes you do see trumpets. Um, uh, you do, with the, with the, which the angels are playing, not the shepherds. Uh, and what else do you see? When you, when you see the shepherds, what do they look like? Are they afraid in those pictures? Because Terrified. But, but see, the way it's depicted, I mean, that's like a happy thing. They have all these angels coming down. Um, but I don't... Usually the image is like before, you know, they get the word to go. The image is like they appear and, well, imagine, no matter whether the, no matter the message, why do almost all the art and all the recreations show the shepherds as basically being terrified? Why? Why would well, that be? If the, if the guys are out there and they're eating or, or maybe getting ready for sleep or something like that, and it's a calm night because that's the way it's depicted. Yep. Yes. To hear, you know, these angels come down, all of a sudden the light just get, and there's trumpets. Yeah. The yeah. Last thing. Yes. You know, that's, they're probably, you know, just saying good night and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I place yourself in the place of these shepherds. Put yourself in their place. Ordinary work. You just said it beautifully. Ordinary workers going about their daily routine, and then. Your surprise and the mixture of awe and fear and joy at what you saw in the night sky and the news you've just heard from the angels. Imagine yourself, see, be you being in that situation. Imagine times when you have seen things, and we talked about this last week, the unbelievable, but seeing things so astonishing that what does the face of a person who's seen something absolutely astonishing look like? What does the typical human face look like when we're seeing something absolutely astonishing? Like that picture of the screen. <laughs> picture of what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, mouth open, eyes wide open. Usually the hands are like, what? You know, what is this? The, the, the body is tense, stressed, right? Seeing this type of thing. Uh, have you ever seen anything before that puts you into that kind of posture? Have you ever seen anything before where you just stood there and went, what? What am I seeing here? I'll tell you where to find that. If you go on, I guess it would be Twitter or YouTube, any of them, and they show these uh, public freakouts is what they call them. Uh, and it's, it's people doing these crazy things, that are usually angry, and there are people watching them that are just like, you know, I can't believe I'm seeing this. You know, why is this person freaking out? You know, what is going on? There's all, I like looking at the bystanders more than the person freaking out, because they're like, you know, this can't be happening. There's a lot of them in airports. <laughs> a lot of them that happen in airports. Uh, another one is like, these mass uh, shoplifting events that happen. And, and people just stand there watching them take this stuff. They don't know what to do. And they're like, I can't believe I'm seeing this, you know. So it's, it, it, it's like that. Of course, this is a wonderful thing, not a terrible thing. But let's remember also, the shepherds did not know what was going to happen. They had zero idea. But you, but there's, in that picture that we're talking about, yep. don't we always see the star in the sky that's, you know, illuminated with the... So my, my thinking is, well, those guys are looking at that star, and they're all sitting around going, well, what do you think that is? Yeah. Like, what yep. is that thing? Well, that well I, well, I hate to destroy your crash, but the star did not happen until Jesus was like three years old. Because we know that from the language, they went to the house. The wise men went to the house, right? To the house. That's the word. And they saw not the infant, the brephos, but the piedon, the child, which was the definitive word for 
a child, a toddler normally. So, but the fact that they were living, Mary and Joseph were living in a house then, and in Nazareth, well, I'm sorry, in Bethlehem, the fact they were living in a house in Bethlehem was, um, um, you know, that, that was um, uh, something else was going on there. And then they fled from Bethlehem when Herod began to seek out the, to, to kill the, the newborn and then firstborn. Then they went back to Nazareth. So what I'm saying is the, it seems, the, the text seems to indicate that the wise men came later, and it would, or the magi came later. And that would kind of make sense because, first of all, they traveled a long way. Secondly, they, um, um, Herod had warned them. You know, they came and told Herod. They were introduced to Herod. And then they had to spend quite a bit of time looking and following what, what the star indicated. It was really interesting. I was out the other night. Who, what, is Jupiter in ascension right now? What's the, what's the kind of orange-looking? Mars. Mars, okay. And if, you know, I was standing there and... I went out earlier when it was dark, and Mars was over here, right? Came back out a little bit later, like 11, and Mars was up here. I'm going, oh, that's how they followed the star, right? They just kind of went along, and of course, I know you teach a course on that. And, uh, um, but it's interesting that, that the, the, I think later is possible. I mean, most scholars say that it was later that it happened, that that all didn't happen in one night. And Christians, of course, depict it all. They collapse the story, but they are two different stories in two different Gospels. And that's really important. As we said, Matthew shows us the Magi. Luke shows us the birth. And so they're, they're really quite different. Uh, and, of course, Matthew, the reason Matthew, remember, Matthew wants to show that because they are coming to honor the king, the Messiah, the promised one, the king. And Luke wants us to know that this newborn child is a descendant of David. And David is the shepherd. The she now, that is important to this story. David was the shepherd boy, the least in the house is of Jesse, right? The least one. And Samuel came, you know, and, you know, here comes all the, all of Jesse's kids, right? And the big, you know, they're big strapping sons. And, and, and Samuel goes, well, we're missing one. And so then Jesse says, well, there's David. He's out in the field. He's a shepherd. He's out in the field. You know, you know he's the youngest. You don't want to miss him, right? Said so, so Samuel goes, go get him. So they go get him, and Sammy goes, that's the one. Bunch, pours the, you know, anoints him with oil. And so Luke knows this story. So Luke is using shepherds very intentionally here. I mean, the story is, is highlighting the shepherds in so many different ways. But the shepherds are the very image of what God was doing, right? Not just in the way, and Luke, of course, is the one more than Matthew, that talks about the humility of God has come for the humble. God has come for the marginalized. God has come for the ones that up till then their religion has excluded, basically. And so here's these shepherds, right? Uh, another thing that we have to remember about the shepherds is, and this is very, I think the most important thing, they are mobile. They move. That's what they do. They go to different pastures. You know, shepherds were hired hands. They were ranchers, right? They contracted with different ranch owners. So they moved around a lot. So the question that scholars want to always answer is, how did this word about this birth, about this possible miracle get out so quickly into the world? Luke says that the shepherds spread it into the countryside. Well, they were the perfect ones to do that. Because they were mobile. They went out in the different areas and worked. So they would have told this story, right? And also they had the time, if you're talking about the, dis the, the length of time between the birds. And the yes. Um, they've got like a year. But even if it's a couple of months. Yes. To wander around yep. and keep telling the same story. Exactly. I mean, it's more, I mean, they just, this is a story as they moved around that they told. So that by the time, see, and this is something really important that both Matthew 
and Luke emphasize, and even John does so, and Mark as well, but not, neither one of them had the birth narratives. But people knew that something had happened. And I mean, that word got out. You know, they were a word of mouth culture. So that was how they, that, that was their mass communication. So word got out that something had happened, something amazing. And that word, so when Jesus emerged, when Jesus emerged as in his ministry, following John, right? Jesus emerged, then it was not so surprising for what people were saying about it. Remember, they were, the, the disciples were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for him. They had heard that he, something had happened. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Exactly. Rationalize that way. They would be communicating with the lowest class people who didn't have that whole religious education. That's correct. Who would be more likely to accept that story. Exactly correct. And let's add on top of that, that was kind of the folk religion, the folk religion that was underneath the formal religion, right? And the Messiah was very much a product of the folk religion. Um, because the, obviously the, the religion of Israel had all these hoops that the Messiah would have to jump through, all these certifications, you know, had to get their graduate degree, right, and all that kind of thing, be certified. But Jesus emerged out of folk, folklore, folk religion, right? And, they, and the disciples had been looking. They were, some of them had been with John, but they were, uh, John the Baptist, but they were looking for him. Why were they looking for him? Because they had heard that something had happened. Now, whatever they heard it, however they heard it, they were pretty accurate verbally back then in passing news. When they passed news, they had, it, it, their brains were wired differently. You know, the way we communicate wires our brains, just like my daughter. Our, our children are wired completely differently to communicate. Really, they are than we are, totally differently. They, because that's, that, the brain adapts to the way people communicate. So they, were, they could hear something and pass it along accurately very quickly. So it's quite, it's quite an, I did a study on that. It was quite, quite an interesting thing. So, so the question Susan Robb asked us, go ahead. Did you, were you going to say something, Jim? Okay. question Susan Robb asked us is, how can fear hold us back from experiencing something new and amazing? And what she wants us to do is take a look at John 11, which you will see after Luke 2. And I'm going to read a little bit of this. Um, uh, and we're going to, I want you to look at each of these characters. This is the story of the raising of Lazarus. But fear, you will hear fear in every actor, actor or character in this drama. Okay. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son, may be glorified, Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And are you going there again? Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas had this optimistic attitude, didn't he? <laughs> then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed. Uh, now we're moving ahead in the story. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Next. Next. 
Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. A terrible thing, right? And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. A rational fear, let me point out. Uh, at that time, a rational fear. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. Now, let's look at the fears of each of these three players here. First, the disciples. What is their fear? What is their fear? Going back into a turmoil. Going back, not only just into turmoil, but into what? Well, because they said they would stone. Yeah, yeah. So they were afraid he'd be killed. What about themselves? What, what did Thomas say? We're going, to go, we're going to die with him, right? I mean, if he goes back, and I, you got to wonder how Thomas said that if he wasn't almost saying the opposite. You know, we're going to go and die with him. Do you really want to do that? You know, because it sounds like there was a little bit of hesitation um, to, um, to going, maybe. I mean, they didn't want to die. Then, Martha, what's Martha's fear? Why? What's the reason? He's been dead for four days, and there's a stench of his death. And what's the, along with the fact that it's very unpleasant, what's the problem with that in, the, in that time? It was blasphemous. It was, it was decay. The smell of decay was considered, or to have any contact with that, I wouldn't say blasphemous, but it would make you unclean. It would make you unclean. Uh, even to smell it would make you unclean. This is how the laws were structured. So you left bodies to people, you know, usually the Gentiles or to slaves, who would do that work. The righteous Jew wouldn't go anywhere near it. So um, that is, um, you know, so there. She, her fear is a religious fear. You are breaking the religious law by opening this tomb. Of course, Jesus didn't really care about that, right? Uh, you're breaking the, the religious law, the stench. It will make us unclean. It will make you unclean. Uh, and Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you this? Notice that her fear is blocking her ability to believe. Her fear is blocking her ability to believe that this is going to happen, right? I know. Just disgusting. I mean, she and you got to remember that this miracle is only in John. Only in John. And that the miracles of resurrection that we see usually happen immediately after death. Immediately. This was different. Well, they had to make sure that it was from the dead, not just a mistake. And this is why, this is why, and you know, three days. Three days was the period of time they would wait to see if someone actually were dead. That's why the women came to anoint the body in three days. Because three days, you know, I mean, people actually you know, could be in a coma. They didn't have any means of knowing what was really going on. People could be snake bitten, appear to be dead, paralyzed, you know, that kind of thing. So, but the three days was their mark. Uh, but this is the fourth day. And that's really important as well. So uh, now... Since this did happen on the fourth day, who gets in on the story next? Since this did happen on the fourth day. The, the Pharisees, right? And the council, the high priest. And what is their fear? What is their fear? I think they've got two fears. One, Rome's going to come down on them. And two, it's upsetting the status quo. 
The exact, both of them. And that is, those are, the last one's not a rational fear. The Messiah was supposed to upset the status quo. But the first one is very much a rational fear. I mean, if you read the history of what was going on then, it didn't take much to bring down the wrath of Rome upon, upon Palestine, upon Judea. It, it happened all the time. Ro the Roman army was constantly chasing around false messiahs, revolutionary leaders. This happened constantly. So, you know, this, this, they have a rational fear here. And that fear is so strong that Caiaphas says, look, we're going to have to kill him because it's better that one man die than we lose our nation, you know, without remembering that the Messiah, the Messiah had come to basically recreate the nation, right? Recreate the nation. So, so there's that. So anyway, so fear can hold us back from new things. It can. I mean, it can block us, and that's kind of what Susan Rob's pointing out, that, that, that this kind of fear might have blocked, you know, the shepherds at first, at first would have blocked them from actually even hearing what was going on. Uh, but then they went on, and we see fear throughout the story. So there's that word from the angels always, fear not. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy. Um, so let's talk about an unexpected Christmas, which is another part of this, this uh, text that she has or talks about. She talks about an unexpected Christmas. She tells her own story of the, her child having to have an appendectomy at Christmas. Uh, and, um, you know, and have you ever had, in your sense, have you ever had Christmas ruined for you? And I mean in the tradition of, you know what I mean, of the way you expect to celebrate it. Can you recall that you, you don't have to be personal about it, but do you recall a time when that happened? Yeah, what do you what do you mind sharing what it was that ruined uh, it for you? I've had, I've had several I've had several Christmases like that um, in my life and um, yeah, I, I think that that's that's a really Yes, yeah, down and out times, yeah, yeah. 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 But... Sickness can easily mm -hmm. <laughs> ruin Christmas. Yeah. I, uh, the sickest, I think some of the sickest I've ever been was just this Christmas before I came here. And it was, I had never in 40 years missed a Christmas Eve service, ever, ever. Uh, and, and, or the Sunday before Christmas. And it was in Texas where I was working as an interim, and I got so sick. This was just weeks before I came here. I came here January the 1st. I was so sick. And I kept losing weight and losing weight and losing weight. I got sicker and sicker and sicker. And I had to literally go in daily to get IVs. And, uh, you, know, glue, you know, just be rehydrated. That's how sick I was. And I missed it. And it was like there was no Christmas, you know. Zero Christmas. Which I enjoyed doing the services. And there was no Christmas. And I felt terrible because, you know, they were counting on me to do it, right? Um, so I think what Susan Robb is telling us and is giving us this example is what Mary and Joseph must have been feeling in regards to the birth of their child up to this point. Uh, everything had gone wrong for them, right? I mean, Mary had been given the Annunciation, but the angel didn't say how tough this was going to be, right? Well, I mean, she was Yes. Didn't know the background, and even though yeah. Joseph is being all, you know, good about it, and he's staying by her side. Uh, other people aren't aware of the story that they've been told. They have no idea. That's right. Why both of them are putting up with this? 
and, and even more, even more, uh, the, if you look at the, I mean, she describes in her book, Susan Robb, very vividly what that trip would have been like for a woman who was that late, turn, late, you know, at late stage in their pregnancy. And she said they might have had a donkey, but they may have just walked it, you know, the 90 miles between the two. That's a long way. So it's a good seven, eight, eight day journey. And a lot of it's uphill in rocky, you know, in rocky areas to get from where they were to where they needed to be in Bethlehem. So it was a very, very difficult, difficult trip. And um, so they get there. And then, as we know, we, we're not 100 percent sure what again, your question is put them in a manger. Well, a manger was in a house, too, as we know, because the animals were fed. The animals would be outside and there was a big hole cut in the wall and the hay would be laid inside and they would just kind of, you know, come up and and eat there. And that that is probably I had this wonderful. Oh, the best class I ever had was taught by a Palestinian Christian. who's still around, great guy. Uh, and uh, he came and, and told us, here's the way it was, because this is still the way Palestine is, and explained they would not have been forced out into some weird barn or something. That was not how it was done. They would have, even if it wasn't a house of a relative, they would have been found, they would have found them a place to stay in a home, but the manger would have been probably the best place to put them. You know, and then Susan Robb talks about why that was why that was the case for various different reasons, but but so here they are in the midst of this, needing this affirmation. You know, where is God's presence in this? Needing this affirmation, and the affirmation comes in the form of these shepherds that tell them this amazing story. Uh, one of the things that Susan Rob wanted us to look at, our time's getting really short here. In fact, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, this is an interesting question. I, I highlighted some of the more interesting questions she asked. How might Mary's experience with the angel and with the arrival of the visitors to the manger have prepared her to be mother to a child who was destined for conflict. Throughout the book, Rob reminds us that the crash ultimately leads to the cross. He also says something wonderful, that Mary was the only one at the crash and at the cross, the only one. Joseph wasn't there. We think Joseph died. Mary was there at both. So. If you think about it, the question that I had kind of noted to ask was, you know, what does this tell us about her? And I think one of the questions I wanted to th us to think about is, what vision had the angels and the shepherds placed in her heart so that she would be able to endure all of this? Think of what she had to endure. Her life was anything but ordinary, right? Even though she had more children, we know that for sure. What vision had the angels and shepherds placed in her heart to be able to go from the crash to the cross and everything that happened in between? What do you think that vision was? That she wouldn't be alone, that, that there was community already starting to form. Yes, very good. Very, yeah, oh, great, great. The community was coming. The community had come to them already. What else? What else was the vision in her heart? Mm -hmm. to raise this child. Good. That's really good to put it in the form of a mission. <laughs> you wear, you know, that Blues Brothers, we're on a mission from God, right? Yeah. So Mary is on a mission from God. She has to look at it that way so that everything that's happening, she has to go, this is a part of that. The angel even warned her that you will feel, you know, you will be stabbed in the heart. That's what they basically the angel said. You will have this will happen. You'll be stabbed in the heart as well, because uh, she's talking about, of course, the cross. The angel's talking about the cross. So, so you know, it's 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 a um, uh, uh, it, she had to be thinking. You know, this is my purpose in life. This is why I'm here. And it's interesting that Mary basically this is what's incredible disappears 
after Jesus ascends. She, we don't see her anymore. Oh, they write a lot of stories about her and stuff, but believe me, she disappears. The rest is backfill from way later. She disappears. And that's interesting in and of itself. Her mission is done. She fulfilled her mission. She goes back to being that ordinary person who belonged to the church and was honored in the church, of course, but, but she was a member of the Christian church. Uh, and, uh, but she really just disappears. We don't really know what happened to her. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, and the reason being, the Christian community was very clear about, you know, that the focus was going to be on Jesus, not on Mary. It wasn't going to be on her. It was going to be on Jesus. And somehow that got kind of tripped up later, much later, uh, and turned into the Mariology thing. Uh, but it's still, the fact that she disappears in the writings, yeah. Um, when we went to Turkey to visit our son, mm -hmm. I picked up a book that talked about all the Ephesus and all the Christian churches that are in Turkey. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it, at one of these sites that's been archaeologically explored, there's this little house-like thing on the property, and they believe, or the tradition says, that John housed Mary, the mother of Jesus, in that little house. Right, right. But he took care of her. Yeah, but that's, and, and that's backfill. said, mother behold your son, son behold your mother. Yeah, but, but actually what they have discovered accurately is Peter's house in Caesarea, which is really interesting. They've arca and they've, they've excavated, and it has been identified as such. Um, uh, that's when they can actually archaeologically identify. Because all we're left to us now, we're, they, they've scoured us out over 2,000 years. What we have now that's opening things up to us is archaeology. Archaeology is teaching us a lot about this. So uh, the more I read about read archaeology, the more I'm learning about the newest discoveries, and they're very interesting. They really are. So let's look at the theme of the shepherds and the angels. Uh, what I want to do is start with um, 1 Samuel 17 on page 2 down at the bottom. We've got some passages here. Um, that, that kind of connect the whole theme of the shepherds. Why the shepherds were there. Why did the angels come to the shepherds? But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine, Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. So this shepherd who becomes king, what qualities? He's connecting the shepherding job to being the king. And what are those qualities? What are those qualities that you read there? Huh? Protecting the flock. Protecting. What else? Good. What else? Protecting. Good. What else? To protect, what characteristics do you need to have? Well, let's just start from there. I mean, they didn't have, they didn't have guns and rifles and things like that. Uh, so what would it take? What, would it, what kind of person would you have to be to do that? Exactly. Very good. Courage. 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 You had to have flat out, the shepherds had to be courageous. Their lives were on the line out there. I mean, they did fight. Again, there were snakes. There were just, it was, you know, humans didn't have the advantage back then, by the way. 
Um, and so uh, there's that fact of courage. The fact of being willing to stand up when the others wouldn't, when nobody else would. So that's really a very vivid image of the shepherd. And then we read next page from John. This is Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to the fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Isaiah. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, and then uh, I won't go to Isaiah 40. Uh, it's about you know, a voice crying out in the wilderness. But what I will say, what I will say is look at the, quality, the things the shepherd does, which are the qualities of what Jesus did. Guidance, protection, um, uh, gathering, gathering the flock moving the flock forward out into the different pasture lands to keep them alive. I mean, it, so many things. So that shepherds actually, I think what she wants us to understand is more than just being the fact they were kind of common, ordinary people, that there was a real theological purpose to this story, that shepherding was the very theme and essence of the whole story from the beginning of what God was doing in the world, right? So pastor, I'm called a pastor. Where does that come from? Pastoral. <coughs> Pastoral, right? The pastor, the shepherding. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a theme that still runs through uh, to this day, what we do as Christians. So, um, that, so, so then, so this is what the shepherds are, you know, are representing. Um, so let, let me ask another question. Why, do, again, I'm, I'm not going to ask the question. I'm just going to remind you. The question I have was, why do you think that God would have chosen such a group to be the first evangelist? Well, again, I think it's because the qualities that they had, the fact they moved around a lot, the fact they moved around a lot, the fact, I think, brilliantly pointed out, that they were common folks and would communicate with common folks. They wouldn't be talking to the high priest. High priest wouldn't even be around them, probably. They were kind of low. And there may have even been Gentiles among them, too. That's not mentioned, but Gentiles were shepherds. There were plenty of them. So this may have kind of crossed over from Judaism into the Gentile world. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, have you ever seen something so wonderful or heard something so wonderful that you had to tell others right away? What kind of things that happen to us in our lives that we want to tell somebody about immediately? Good things that we want to tell somebody about right away. Our friend has a baby. Good. Good. Very good. 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 Very good. What else? What else? Things that happen in our lives that we want to tell somebody about. Some milestone. Milestone, okay. Milestones. I, my, uh, I guess my Steve's family decided to give us a prize party for his parents. Maybe 45th anniversary or something. And so they came up to Phoenix, well, we were down to Phoenix and walked in. And the whole time his mother was saying, oh, I can't go wait to get back and tell my Friends. Exactly. The weirdest thing. I mean, well, exactly. why don't you enjoy it while you're here? But that was her thought was that she could share this and she was so excited about it. There's this wonderful book about evangelism that came out in the Southern Presbyterian Church when I was first started in ministry called Good News Travels Faster. And the idea was if you really regard Christian, the, the, the story of Christ and what Christ offers in grace and mercy and the kingdom of God is good news. This is something you want to share. Something you should not be feel like you have to share. Something that you want to share. 
So I thought that was always a kind of an interesting uh, theme uh, or an interesting idea. And I, it's true. Has anyone ever given you an important message to take to somebody else before? Has anybody ever given you an important message to take to somebody else? And what did that feel like? What did that feel like? It's a real sense of responsibility. And you can imagine these shepherds getting this news, you know, go find this child. Go find this child. They didn't say here, they didn't get to go and look on Google Maps to get there, right? <laughs> go find this. You will find this child lying in a manger. Well, that's not real good directions, you know? You know, you'll find this child. So they had to go looking. They had to go asking you know anybody who's having a baby right now? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But during that time, they were also sharing the... the, the yeah, story. exactly. And maybe Kevin No, that, there, that it says others were already gathered there at the manger. Yeah, what I mean is, yes, they brought others with them probably. I guarantee you it wasn't just the shepherds that got there, right? We're missing some people from the crash aren't we? We are. We're missing some people. We need to start putting little figures in there, you know? So uh, more figures because there could have been a crowd there because the shepherds are going to tell this story. Of course, shepherds knocking on your door in the middle of the night may not have been a real comfortable thing. Uh, they didn't have ring back then either on their doorbell. So, uh, so here's how Susan Rob wants us to close, and I think it's a good closing. If we think about shepherds and what they did that night and what shepherds do and what Jesus said in calling himself the good shepherd. How do we show the shepherding life of being a Christian in our own lives? She's talking about angels, right? And of course there is that idea of angels, you know, that, we, that there are angels, living angels, right? But, but what aspects of shepherding do we have responsibility for in our lives that reflect on what the shepherds were and what they did? So what do you think? Think, of, think again about what the shepherds did. Being a parent. What's that? Being a parent. Being a parent. Good, good. What else? Taking care of people that don't have as much. Very good. Very good. Very good. Or, yeah. Or even protecting people that don't have the strength. Very good. Very good. What else? Taking the vulnerable, telling the good news, however we do it, telling the good news. And you don't have to go out and knock on doors to tell the good news. We've got a million ways to do that. I think the food bank does a beautiful job of telling the good news. I really do. There's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, guiding, guidance, guidance, guidance. You know, there's the guiding part of that. Gathering the flock. There's that part of that. All of that is still a responsibility for we who are disciples of Jesus Christ. I mean, Christ will gather us when the time comes, but we are in the act of gathering and not letting people in need become isolated, but bringing them in, bringing them in. So I'm going to stop right there. And um, she uses the illustration of uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, which is great. She, she used that in a great way of how the little tree, you know, uh, everybody's laughing at Charlie Brown. And then Linus reads the story. And then they, they what do you say, what, repair the tree, right? All gather and take, take all the decorations off of Snoopy's house, which has won the first prize for the community decoration, and put it on the tree. Uh, it's such a good, good special. It really was amazing. And, uh, and, and it, she says that kind of illustrates what it means to, to what we are to do in regards to renovating lives, to bringing up people who are like these little trees that are just there and making them special, bring, and the, bringing them into the love of Christ or showing them the love of Christ. So uh, I'm going to close with our prayer and uh, thank you all for being a part of the class. And if you're able to come starting the second Sunday of January, we'll be in the chapel. Okay.
Let's pray. Lord, we remember how you sent your angels to bring the news of how you were working in our world. And we know that in Jesus you came to stay. That you are working each day to reveal your love for every last one of us. We know that you still work through angels in our midst in ways we don't fully understand. And that sometimes you call on us to be your messengers who help people feel your presence. Help us to be faithful to that call and to your message so that the good news of your rescuing and enabling love spreads like the light of the dawn onto a world where many still feel surrounded by darkness. Amen. Thank you all. Uh